Hello, welcome to our final video for Energy 101. This time we're talking again with Dr. Elizabeth Wilson, who is the director for the Arthur L. Irving Institute for Energy and Society. And this time she'll be talking to us about energy policy. Welcome, Elizabeth. Hi, good to see you, Megan. Yeah, great to have you back. All right, well, let's get started. So before we actually launch in, I would really like to first start by asking you if you can quickly define policy for us. So, so what is it and what's encompassed by that word? That is a great question. I mean, largely we can think about it as a set of rules, principles, or guidelines that organizations use to plan for future goals. In reality, it can be made lots of different ways by lots of different organizations. And as we'll explore in the energy sector, there's a lot of times many different actors with many different interests that are involved in um, changing the energy system or aligning it to climate goals. Fantastic, thank you. All right, so who is actually making energy policies and, and who's involved in that decision-making and those processes? Can you tell us a little bit about that? I can, and I, and I think that the interesting way to think about energy policy is we, we, in, in the policy world, we call it multi-scalar, meaning you have actors at the federal level who are making some decisions. You have other people at the state level making decisions. And I'll talk just briefly also about actors at the regional level. But depending on the energy system you're talking about, whether it's oil production or pipeline management or siting or electricity markets, you'll have different actors involved. And so when you're thinking about just the very different federal agencies involved in making policy. I mean, here's just a few of them. Um, from the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission to the Department of Energy that's setting rules for efficiency, Department of Transportation controls pipelines and other types of, of siting. Um, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, how they're managing pollutant uh, levels for different plants. And so on and on and on. And, and, and every energy kind of problem or issue can have different constellations of these actors, depending on the regulatory jurisdiction and, and, and issue that you're looking at. Yeah, and so that's at the federal level, but you have to appreciate that for actually siting or building a project, it's interacting with the state level and regional level as well. So one of the examples I prepared was to think about it from the electricity sector perspective. And for that, you've got the, the federal level, like the Department of Energy, the FERC, the EPA, and Congress making different types of rules. But then you have regional actors, like the regional transmission organizations that a lot of people don't know about, but that control the markets. They're doing long-term planning. They're doing um, operations on a daily basis. And then the state organizations, like the public utility commissions, consumer advocates, and others that are helping make energy policy, electricity policy on the state level. Great. Thank you. Um, can you talk a little bit about what maybe makes energy policy difficult? What is there anything that makes these making decisions in energy policy challenging? Can you can you talk a little bit about that? I think that it's important to step back and appreciate that all policy making is difficult. If you think about difficulty as bringing in different opinions, different interests, and aligning to a, a, a coherent set of goals to move forward. For energy policy, you're affecting the technical, you're affecting the business, you're affecting social society in lots of different ways. And how those intersect at those different levels really provides opportunities for incredible advancements and transformations, or as we've seen also, incredible resistance to any types of change. So thank you for that, Elizabeth. What are, are there a couple of examples of really kind of highly controversial consequential energy policies um, that are sort of happening right now or in the works um, that you can maybe give us as an example and, and maybe how these might affect us um, in our lives? It's interesting that you asked that question. Yesterday, I was uh, doing some of the final edits on the law textbook, and I was looking at a couple of the different state um, goals to make their economies net zero energy by 2050. Um, and what I really appreciated was how much it was an interplay between so many different actors. The, you know, if you're talking about putting in electric vehicles, you're thinking about the transportation department as well as the utilities, and you're putting in the rate makers who are, you know, the public utility commissioners. You're thinking about citing different types of charging infrastructure and the equity implications of access for multifamily households or low-income people. And what I really appreciated was these very different um, 
conversations that have to happen across traditionally siloed industries to allow for the transformation of EVs, for example. Um, another technology that we were talking about was a technology called carbon capture and sequestration, where you would capture the carbon from an industrial or process or power plant, pipe it someplace, and then sequester it underground. And one of the things I've appreciated about that technology is just how challenging it is to get all of the parts lined up. I mean, it's one thing to capture the technology that's gonna happen at the plant, piping it someplace to something else, injecting it underground as kind of another person, ensuring that that's there and matching to a climate regime is another challenge. And if it's a cost that isn't kind of part of the system, you can't recover it in rates, it's seen as too risky, it's seen as kind of a not viable technology by some actors, but as essential by other actors, you can appreciate how more contentious that policy and technology can be. So those are just two examples of technologies that are seemingly very important for decarbonizing the energy system, but I appreciate how where you sit is so often where you stand. And one of the pieces about energy policy that I think is really important in, in the US is if you're in the West or the East, you have a very different idea of who a legitimate actor is. So sharing a slide here of you know, who owns the West, and, and when you look in the Western United States, you appreciate that the federal government is a major landowner. And so through BLM, Department of the Interior and, and land management, they end up necessarily playing a larger role in terms of access to public lands for renewables development or for oil and gas development, for siting of power plants. Whereas in the Midwest and East, it's a very different story that has to do with the history of our country, but it really affects energy policy. It affects siting of transmission lines. It affects kind of who is involved in those decisions and who's considered a legitimate actor. So that where you sit is often where you stand component really plays out in energy and energy policy. Thank you. Um, what is BLM? Oh, Bureau of Land Management. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so we hear a lot about both climate policies and energy policies. Can you talk a little bit about how the two are connected? Yeah, I mean, climate policy is energy policy. And energy policy is climate policy. I mean, any large trends, large changes we make in the energy system are absolutely critical for addressing the climate problem. And I like to think about this not only as reducing emissions, but also adapting our energy system to be viable and reliable in this climate changing world we're moving into. Um, states like California with all of the fires and other problems, the flooding, the changes in weather have really highlighted again and again and again, the vulnerability of our electric system, the vulnerability of our uh, ability to provide fuel for people when, when the power is out. And so I think that that design question will be one that we see more and more in the decades to come. All right, thank you. Um, can you talk a little bit about how we as individuals can maybe be involved in energy policy decisions, um, perhaps from a community to even potentially a national scale? So the first thing we can do is vote. <laughs> that is the most important thing or run for office. There's a lot of positions that are making energy decisions all the day, whether you're working uh, in your city government and the town clerk is making decisions about how to choose different energy providers or retrofit efficiency in their communities. Those types of things can really have an important role in how we use energy in our lives. As an individual, you can also make your own energy choices. Um, these are in your personal lives, but these are also at work. If you're making decisions about purchasing, you can think about energy in different ways. Um, at the state level, um, that's where a lot of people get involved, or at the community level, there's often uh, community solar initiatives or other types of projects there. But I, I, I want to just ensure that we're not thinking that our local initiatives are enough because of the big system that we're part of. And so even getting involved at the state level and not recognizing some of these other forces driving energy, driving energy change is really tricky. And because so many of these decisions are so deeply technical, getting involved in a regulatory proceeding at the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission really is insider baseball and very, very hard 
but one that has ramifications for how energy can and will work, um, sometimes nationally, for decades to come. So there is innovation in the regulatory space that I think we need to be a little bit more cognizant about and, and think forward, um, thinking not only about the technologies needed to change, but how do we actually change our regulations and our institutions to support the energy transition that we always talk about. All right, thank you. Um, so you you have the final word in our <laughs> Energy 101 series, which is wonderful. Um, so I'd like to ask you one more question and then feel free to add anything else that you feel like we've missed so far in the discussion that you think is important for people to know in this video yeah. about energy policy. Um, but can you start out with, in your opinion, you know, what policy changes are most important to for us to foster sustainability and just energy transitions? That's so huge. I mean, we just went over kind of the multi-scalar levels and how you need to work together in new kinds of ways. I've really appreciated how certain types of changes are easier in certain parts of the system than others. And some things that look impossible are actually quite easy and some things that look easy are actually impossible. Um, and so when I think about, you know, what is feasible um, that's where I, I, I think about how do we make that sustainable, because all too often we, we tie ourselves up in knots on these other pieces. And I just want to recognize that our legacy energy system has had huge impacts on people, both for good and for bad. Um, the One of the real drivers in the, the climate legislation in states like California and Maryland really is not only reducing greenhouse gases, but also reducing criteria air pollutants, which disproportionately affect poor communities, minority communities, communities of color. So when we're thinking about changing that energy system, ensuring that we're asking how the current system affects people, how do we reduce those legacy impacts, and how do we build a system back for the future that is affordable, reliable, and one that's sustainable. And so thinking about it across these different scales, across these different communities is really important for all of us. And I'm just so happy that those who stuck with Energy 101 are still here. And I wanna thank you for your participation in this series. Those of us who work at the Irving Institute think this is one of the most interesting and important things we can be doing with our lives. And we hope that you do too. Um, please keep in touch and we look forward to engaging with you more in the future. Thanks everybody. Thank you again so much to Elizabeth for joining us and thank you to all of you. This is our final video for Energy 101. So we're looking forward to seeing you for our last group discussion this Wednesday at 4.30 on Zoom. And don't forget to check out all of the other stuff that we have going on at the Irving Institute and different ways that you can get involved. And we'll see you on Wednesday. Thanks. <laughs>